All right, welcome back for part two of today's lecture. Uh, still working with Fee and Stewart, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And we're actually going to focus on chapter one right now, and especially in terms of how to go about interpreting scripture. And so we want to be faithful interpreters of scripture. And in chapter one, Fee and Stewart provide us a pretty good method for how to interpret scripture. A couple big words they introduce us to, and then a methodology that they give us. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. So I'm sure a word that's fairly new to most of you is the word, the word exegesis. Hopefully you can see that okay. Don't have too much glare in here. I uh, can't do much about lights today. Uh, so, so exegesis, and the idea is ex is out. Jesus is the word for reading. And so the goal is to read out the meaning of the authors to read out their intended meaning. What we want to avoid is eisegesis. Eis is the Greek word for in or into. And so we're trying to avoid reading our meaning, our values into the text. We want to read out the meaning, read out the intention, read out the values of those who are writing these texts. Okay, so uh, back in looking at the voice, Genesis 4.1, uh, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, discovered the pleasures of lovemaking. There you have an example of eisegesis, where the translator is reading into the text contemporary values. Okay, what we want to do is avoid that, and so that we stay faithful and we're reading out the intent, the values of the writers there. And we believe that as we do that, that's actually going to help us better understand who God is. So our goal is exegesis, okay, reading out the intention. Second big word that you met was hermeneutics. Okay, with hermeneutics, hopefully I spelled it right. Uh, with hermeneutics, the idea is interpreting or bringing it into kind of contemporary understanding. Okay, so to... To, to practice hermeneutics is basically, okay, what does it mean for us today? So exegesis, what did it mean back then and there? Hermeneutics, we take what it meant back then and there, and we figure out, okay, how do we apply it to life today? So one way to look at this is exegesis is dealing with the what question. What was the writer trying to accomplish back then in their day? What were the intentions of the writer? What, what did the writer mean? And then hermeneutics, now we're talking contemporary significance. And so now the question becomes, so what? So what difference does it make? So what were they trying to say? So what difference does it make for us today? So hermeneutics is taking that historical work of that what and applying it to contemporary life today. Uh, what do we, how do we bring this to bear upon our lives? Now, to do good exegesis, there are several questions that need to be asked. And so the first context of questions is historical context. So we'll go ahead and put this over here. We're going to ask questions about the historical context of the writers as well as the readers. So we want to know what was going on in their world. We want to know what the readers were experiencing. We might ask political questions. We might ask geographical questions, topological questions. We might ask about their cultural customs, how their economy worked. We might ask all kinds of questions to try to get back into that historical context. Okay, but the most important question to ask is the question of occasion and purpose. So what was going on amongst the readers and maybe between the readers and the writers to where the person writing the text felt compelled to write? So what was the occasion, what was happening, and what was the goal of the writer? And so one of the things that we'll begin to do is we'll learn to, to read that these texts were produced with a goal in mind. Maybe the goal is greater faithfulness. Maybe the goal is repentance. But we'll discover time and again that there is something going on 
And the writer felt compelled to write, compelled by the Holy Spirit to write, to speak, to address that situation with the goal of bringing about a, a, a result, a change. And so there's, there's occasion and then there's the purpose of the writer. So we always want to ask the occasion and purpose question as we work with historical context. Huge question that we always want to have in front of us. Uh, next context is literary context. With literary context, we are working with the document as a whole. So rather than just reading, you know, two or three verses at a time, like we did with Genesis 4.1, what the goal is to see the big picture and to see where the, where the passage that we're working with fits within that big picture. Okay, so if I go ahead and erase this real quick, and let's say here I have, this is the book of Genesis. Okay, well, one of the things I want to do when I'm thinking about literary context is I'm thinking about where my passage fits within the whole. So let's say, for example, I'm working with Genesis 12, which is the call of Abraham. You guys will be reading about that soon enough. So it'd be real easy to just focus on Genesis 12 and God's call of Abraham and his promise to Abraham without thinking about anything else, especially since that's about all I can see on my phone screen. Okay, but what we want to do is we want to think about the literary context so that we're thinking about the whole book of Genesis and where our passage fits in. So in chapters 1 through 11, we got the story of creation and the fall and the flood and the Tower of Babel, and things are not looking real good. And we come to Genesis 12, and all of a sudden God calls Abram, makes this amazing promise to Abram that through him, through his offspring, all peoples are going to be blessed. And that begins to shape the whole rest of Genesis, even the whole rest of the Bible. And so Genesis 12, when we begin to look at this literary perspective, we see it's this really crucial hinge passage where God is beginning to, to move into kind of this redemptive rescue operation for the world. So anyways, literary context. We are thinking about our passage of scripture and how it fits within the whole. So we always want to think about the larger context and not just the passage that we're working with. So we have historical context, Asian purpose, literary context, the place of our passage within the whole document that it's a part of. Third area of questioning, and that is, I'll go ahead and put it up here, content. Okay, this is where we begin to unpack the content of our particular passage. Okay, we did that a little bit with Genesis 4.1. We took a look at the word no, yada, and realized, okay, it's not just knowledge about, it's not just information, it's this intimate knowing, this relational knowing. Uh, we looked at the idea of, you know, who got, who got brought forth, Adam or Cain, and how it's a reference to Cain being brought forth well, we could have looked more at some of the language there, but what we were doing there is we were looking at the content of that particular passage. Okay, Genesis 12, if that were a passage, we'd look at this promise to Abraham. What does God mean when he tells Abraham he's going to make him into a great nation, that he's going to give him a great name? So there we're unpacking what's going on in our specific passage that we're focusing on. Okay, so three areas of questioning as we do exegesis. We are looking at the historical context and especially the occasion and purpose. Some refer to this as kind of the world behind the text. Then we're gonna look at the literary context, okay? And so here we're looking at our passage within the overall flow of thought within the document that it belongs to, okay? In this case, Genesis. And so this is kind of the, the world within the text, if you will, some take that approach to it. Okay, and then what we want to do is look at the content. This is our third area of questioning, and this is where we unpack our particular passage. We look at the sentences, the verbiage that's there, key words that are there, uh, try to understand best we can the argument, if you will, the main thrust or intention of the writer. Now, all of this is really good. It gets us back to this what? It gets us back to this intention of the writer. 
Now, what I do is I add one more step in here before we go to hermeneutics. And that step, is, you won't find this in Fee and Stewart, but they kind of have it implied. I like to spell it out. And that step is theological witness. Okay, we're working from the perspective that this is the word of God, that these writers were inspired of God. And so God is working through the writers to reveal God's self to us, the readers, both them and their historical context, and then ongoing today as well. And so we want to try to do our best in terms of to make sure that we don't kind of just read our own values into it. What was being revealed about who God is and what God is doing to these people back then and there in their situation? And so we want to kind of get a, a, a fresh picture of God, if you will, from the passage that we're working with. And so we do all of this work, historical context, looking at the literary context, unpacking the content. We do all of that work so that we can get a, if you will, a cleaner, clearer, truer understanding of who God is. And so what is God revealing about God's self through the writer as the writer addresses this historical context trying to bring about this purpose? Okay, are, are you tracking with me on that? That's what we want to get at. That theological witness, who God is, what we see God doing in the world, what God desires to do, who God desires us to be, who God desires to make us into, to transform us to be. So exegesis, historical context, special occasion and purpose, literary context, the place of our passage within the document that it belongs to, and then unpack the content. We do all of this so that we can better grasp the theological witness of the passage. Who is God being revealed to be? Who is God revealing God's self to be through this writer on this occasion? And then what we want to do is we take that, and that becomes what's applicable to us today. So this is this whole thing, in some sense, is hermeneutics, this art, skill of interpretation, what was written back then and there. But more narrowly defined, hermeneutics becomes, OK, how do we apply this to us today? And so this is what we want to apply, this theological witness, uh, this revelation of who God is. That's what holds weight for us today. And so we'd apply that to life today. And so we would think in terms of Genesis 12 and Abraham and that promise, we begin to think, okay, what's being revealed about God, that God desires to work through this particular man and woman, Abram and Sarai, and that God is going to work through them to bring blessing upon all of us. And from that, we could begin to see, wow, God works through particulars to bless all. And Abram is called, you know, got to develop a little bit more, but Abram is called to trust God, that God is going to work through him, that God is going to fulfill this promise. We would go New Testament, we would see that ultimately this promise is fulfilled through Jesus, but then we might also even see that that's how God works, and maybe God calls you and me not just to bless us, but God calls you and me to work through us to bring blessing to others, much as he did Abram. So just a quick example of how we might work this. But this is what we're going to be doing all through the semester. We're going to be asking questions from these angles, the historical context, the literary context, so that we can better get at the theological witness. And then that theological witness is what becomes, quote unquote, normative for us. That's what's kind of eternally true about God, eternally relevant for all history for all humanity, for all cultures. And we want to kind of latch onto that. Really, we want that to latch onto us so that instead of us just studying scripture and examining scripture, we find ourselves kind of coming under scripture and our lives are being examined and our hearts are being examined. And we find God reshaping us according to who he, he is, who he reveals himself to be through this word. 
All right, well, that's exegesis and hermeneutics. We'll keep working on that. And uh, go ahead and share that with someone. Let them know that you learned two new words, exegesis and hermeneutics, and see if you can put that into your own words. And I'll shut this one down, and then we'll move on to our final mini lecture for today.